on this uh, unusually nice sunny day. Uh, I'm Tom Katowski, a chair of the Economics Department at Portland State University. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Economics Department faculty and staff and other PSU department sponsors, Black Studies, History, Sociology, Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning, Portland Center for Public Humanities, and the Portland State University Library, and our special guests, Robert McCullough, Karen Tozzi, and Joyce Baldwin. We're here for the 2012 Harold Goodhu Botter Memorial Lecture. Professor Botter was on the PSU faculty from 1965 to 2000 and was one of the premier pioneers of economic history. I urge you to read about Harold in the program brochure, about his 90 years on this earth, working in the Roosevelt administration, numerous books and articles, and a passion for the public sector. Now, the passion for the public sector was not romantic, but an analytic belief that the public sector plays a positive role in economic development. I really wish Harold could be here today to tell us his views on the austerity programs that are taking place throughout the world today. And also, Professor Botter's classes on American economic history were always in great demand. As one student commented, Professor Botter is not giving us secondhand information about American economic history. He was actually there. <laughs> Now, what I'd like to do before we start, I just want to relate to you uh, one instance, uh, uh, an encounter that I had with Harold. Uh, this was in the early 1990s, and, and Harold always had an article or a piece of data that he wanted to share. Now, the advent of the copy machine made him even more expansive in this practice. So, Harold cornered me in the office, he showed me the latest publication of the economic report of the president. These were the days that hard copy ruled and this book was just filled with tons of macroeconomic data. Now, Harold pointed out to me that 1992 is the first year on record where private domestic fixed, not residential investment, in equipment and software surpassed investment in structures. And he wanted to know what I thought about that. <laughs> now, actually, he really didn't care what I thought. But, more importantly, he wanted to know why I wasn't thinking about this. I mean, here's a fundamental change in business investment, and shouldn't I be investigating this? You know, by the way, investment in equipment and software continues to surpass investment in structures, and except for recessions, that gap has widened every year, and the technology age ushers in. And Harold, I looked up the data because I know you'd be asking me about it if I didn't. <laughs> but he had made us in that way, uh, as it may be in some respects uh, the most pleasantly annoying way, uh, made us all better researchers about the way he would inquire uh, what we were doing. Now, Harold also had a very long relationship with Professor John Walker of our department, and John relays his regrets that he could not be here today. Uh, for John, would do a much better job and greater justice than I could on relating to you about this brilliant man and one colorful character. So with that, let me turn this over to Mary King and once again, welcome you to our lecture series honoring Harold uh, uh, Goodhue. Thanks, Tom. It's great to see everybody. It's a real pleasure to have you all here for the what we hope is the fifth annual Harold Goodhue Vodder Memorial Lecture. This is both a time to remember Harold in the way that Tom has been, who, as he very correctly pointed out, was a very supportive, fun, and colorful colleague, as well as a really serious scholar and a tremendous teacher. And it's a chance to share in Harold's enthusiasms, especially policy-relevant economic history, dedicated to the big, important topics. Harold would have loved to have been here today to hear from and engage with Gavin Wright. Gavin Wright is the William Robertson Co. Professor of American Economic History at Stanford. He spent his career primarily at Yale, University of Michigan and Stanford, with stints at places like Oxford, Cambridge, and Berkeley. His particular topic has been the economic history of the U.S. South. Now, to those of you who have not spent your lives dedicated to the pursuit of economic history, 
This may sound like rather a bloodless and ethereal career, floating around the world's great universities, lost in reveries about the past. But no, no. This is a career fraught with struggle and conflict. First, economic history over the last several decades was subsumed in a fight. We can over oversimplify for fun in a social setting and say that the fight was between the economists and historians who share the field. And to call on caricature to make a point, historians might have charged economists with the reduction of vast historical dramas to lean mathematical exercises focused on a few boring variables like shipping costs or the price of wheat. An economist in an intemperate moment might have characterized the historians as either pursuing an endless accretion of dusty details that particularize every spot and era, or perhaps even worse from our point of view, erecting a grand narrative arc with only the support of a few anecdotes from partisan perspectives. In this arena, in this admittedly exaggerated conflict, Gavin Wright's work transcended the divide. He had the ability to find a new and interesting approach to topics that pulled together both accepted history and old puzzles into new patterns, well supported by economic theory, statistical analysis, and arch the archival material better beloved by historians. Second, you'd be wrong in thinking economic history as sort of marginal pursuit because Professor Wright's focus on the economic history of the U.S. South has provided him with the opportunity to address the big issues that continue to drive the evolution of economics in fields of development economics, labor economics, public policy economics, and other arenas. Professor Wright's written a large number of articles in several books, but let me just mention three of his books. The Political Economy of the Cotton South, published in 1978, Old South, New South, Revolutions in the Southern Economy Since the Civil War, published in 1986, in which I brought my own copy for him to autograph. And Slavery and American Economic Development, published just recently in 2006. These three are all written to be accessible to the educated public. I recommend them to you all, as well as they are substantial contributions to economic history. Together, they cover the economic consequences of slave production in the U.S. and its legacy up through modern times. Professor Wright's work elaborates the way in which slavery meant that the key economic actors, plantation owners, operated first as labor lords, whose wealth was held in slaves rather than land or other assets. As a result, the planters were not strongly tied to any particular locality. They could move their wealth relatively easily, and did. And consequently, they were not interested in building the kinds of assets and institutions that create economic growth in the long run, including schools, transportation networks, banks, cities. And after losing their wealth and slaves as a result of the Civil War, the planters who formed the Southern economic and political elite became landlords rather than labor lords, for whom the value of their land was greater the cheaper the labor they worked with. And because of that relationship, the planters continued to have little interest in education or communication with the higher wage regions of the country or strategies like industry that were not connected to the value of the land that they owned. The South was an isolated regional economy for decades until it was cracked open by the New Deal, federal labor legislation, and the civil rights movement. But this is a story better left to Professor Wright, who can obviously spin it much more effectively than I can. My intention in sketching this much is really to demonstrate to you how relevant Professor Wright's work is to contemporary development economics, which is focused right now on the genesis and impact of different kinds of institutions and their importance for economic growth. It's very, his work is very connected to contemporary labor economics, which is perennially concerned with how the mechanisms work that allow discrimination between groups of people and the ways that barriers to full participation can be dismantled. 
And his work is also really connected to contemporary public policy economics, which is focused on the costs and benefits of inclusive policy strategies, such as reducing the levels of incarceration and discrimination, or investing in early childhood education, or family policies that keep women in the labor market, all of which can be called policies of inclusion, which appear to pay off. Professor Gavin Wright is a distinguished economic historian, someone with the ability to study a particular situation and see enough in it to inform us about the big enduring questions relevant to many areas of inquiry. So it's an, both a pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Wright this afternoon. Before I turn the floor over to him though, let me just give you a little few ground rules. He's going to speak for you know, 30, 45 minutes, something like this, and then take your big questions at that point. We'll have a Q&A. Please help yourself. There are light refreshments in the back at whatever moment seems wise. And let me not neglect to point out that Professor Wright will also be presenting a seminar, the Economics Department seminar, in 150 Kramer Hall at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon on desegregating southern labor markets. So with that, let me turn it over. Thanks a lot. to this day, 
uh, an important and persistent regional dimension to the subject matter, and I hope I convince you of that by the time I am done. Well, let me anticipate another question that almost always comes up uh, when I start to talk on a topic like this, and that is, how did you get interested in this topic? How did you get interested in the South? And when I hear that question, my first reaction usually is that I want to deconstruct that question and explore its hidden premises and the implicit uh, thinking behind it. But instead of doing that, uh, I propose to answer the question. And so my next few slides are going to be an exercise in self-indulgence. I'm going to tell you about what I was doing in the summer of 1963 uh, when I went down to work on a voter registration project in a little town in a black majority county in the northeastern part of North Carolina. Things are so close, I can walk straight over. Uh, here's what we're talking about. This is a place that is definitely off the beaten track of history. You can read a lot of works, big stacks of work on the history of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you will not read very much about Warren County, uh, North Carolina, and certainly not about this little town. Uh, but I got involved uh, because uh, there was a lot of exciting things going on that year. I put in the previous summer working hard on a construction project, uh, earning what seemed like a lot of money to me, saving up my money, thinking, well, I'll do something more interesting the next uh, summer. And I had no particular involvement, had never been in the South before, uh, but that is where the American Friends Service Committee was organizing their project, and that is where I spent my summer. Uh, and it just so happened, so as of this summer, it will be 49 years ago. Uh, and this was such a powerful influence, I mean, on me, I've been writing about the South ever since, but I've learned that it was a powerful influence on a large number of the participants, so that uh, in the summer of 1963, which will be the 50th anniversary of the famous March on Washington at the end of August, we are going to have the following week a reunion uh, of this little group, uh, and uh, and we're going to try to make it as uh, uh, as much of an engagement with the local community as we had back 50 years ago. And uh, I'd like to come back and tell you how it goes. I don't know if uh, I'll have a chance to do that. But, so let me show you a few pictures since we have now pooled our photos, and, and I want to show you a few things. Uh, here's our group. Uh, you can't tell too much uh, from the group. We're mostly college students, uh, a couple of uh, older people who were uh, advisors. Does it work if I walk, uh, the yeah. temptation to walk uh, across here? Oh, yeah. I sometimes wonder, if maybe I should forget the whole mic thing, but uh, I don't even try to point myself out in there. <laughs> Carolina, and led her mother to think that 
her daughter was engaged in some kind of dubious, shady activity. I can assure you we were not dubious, not shady, but it certainly we were violating the norms and mores uh, of the time. Here's the house. Not all the houses looked like this, but it was a woman, one of the people that we were trying. This was really voter education is what we were trying to do. We were trying to prepare the community for active participation in voter registration. We certainly did not know uh, that there was going to be a Civil Rights Act one year later and a Voting Rights Act two years later. Uh, but we did know that we wanted to encourage people to uh, register and vote, especially black people. We would encourage anyone, but this was a black majority county uh, from which blacks have been systematically excluded from political power uh, as well as economic uh, uh, achievement uh, for its entire history. Main industry in the area was tobacco. Uh, priming tobacco. We actually tried our hand at uh, priming tobacco is the word that's used for harvesting the crop. Uh, this picture is held up so well over these years it almost looks like a picture postcard, but it was taken by one of the members of our group. Uh, and here is a poor quality picture, but the event was very memorable. Baptism by immersion uh, in the river. You see everyone decked out in their Sunday finest clothes uh, in a solemn manner for this ceremony to be going on. It does give you a sense that this really was a community of people, a people with an identity, with a sense of themselves, and that certainly was something that we learned uh, that summer. Here's a local laundromat, and you'll note the white only sign. Lots of jokes about this. Uh, do they, are they talking about the clothes, for example? No, they were not talking about the clothes. And we have another one which I didn't bring along, but one of the black members of our group uh, laughing and pointing to the sign. So that's a memorable uh, thing. Uh, and the next one is a picture of one of the posters that advertised one of our sessions. Citizen.
congressperson, United States congressperson, elected in 1992. So I've gone on to grad school, and as uh, Mary was describing, various academic posts, uh, and uh, it was uh, quite a moment uh, to wake up one morning and hear the radio, and it was a story about the first district in North Carolina, and I'm hearing this voice, and I know that person. This little town, uh, this exercise that seems so futile, uh, we were thinking this is going to be a 50 or 100 year project. You can't really rush these things. And here, 35 years later, Eva Clayton herself was elected to Congress and she served with great distinction uh, uh, for 10 years. Uh, it led me to think I have to go back to this subject uh, and try wrestling a little bit more uh, and see uh, what I can make of it. Uh, what was the connection between the race issue and the economic issue? And that's really the book that uh, I have written, and I'm only going to be talking about a small part of that uh, today. Uh, but when I get done, uh, I will welcome questions on any part uh, of it whatsoever. Uh, it was mentioned about uh, Errol Potter that, you know, he's not just talking about economic history, he was there. Uh, in general, as a principle, it's probably not a good idea to write about history where you were there because you have preconceived attitudes, and so I don't claim to be unbiased. But I do claim to have been struggling with these questions for quite a long time, uh, and I'll give you uh, some of the answers that I have, at least on some, uh, uh, some parts of the questions. Now, the first question that comes up is this. Did the civil rights movement actually have economic goals? as part of its primary agenda. You often hear that it did not, sometimes just as an observation, sometimes as a critique, uh, that the early emphasis was on rights. I mean, the very name civil rights movement is a kind of historical artifact, and it related to the fact that in the South, blacks were denied fundamental rights of citizenship. But I think it's a big mistake uh, to say that they were just focused on rights and only later came to focus on economics. You often hear that about Martin Luther King, uh, that having had these breakthroughs on the race issue, the voting rights issue, that later in his life he came to appreciate that the real issue was economics. No way. He knew that all along, and so did most of the people. Uh, sure, they wanted to put out a program in the most appealing way uh, to, to the rest of the nation, and focusing on human rights and basic rights was uh, uh, Now, uh, can I prove this point? Well. I can't prove it, but I can present a piece of evidence. This will be the last of my Warrington slides, but it, it is one of my favorites. This is one of the brochures for a boycott that was going on uh, in that very town, urging people, uh, targeting black people, not to buy from places where they could not work. It says citizens, all citizens who believe, truly believe in a real democracy, so invoking this wonderful American
See, this is why this really is a challenge to economics. Why does any profit-seeking businessman turn away willing customers with money? It seems contrary to common sense. But I think it was not contrary to common sense. Uh, they thought that their first priority was their white customers. They were the ones with more money, and that they had to make a choice. Uh, if they uh, accepted blacks in these settings that had a certain social context, like sitting at the fountain, they would lose their white customers. Uh, people often think uh, it's one of the ways of explaining away the revolution, the way of denying that it really was a revolutionary change. They say, well, they got rid of, the movement got rid of de jure segregation. Uh, and then they really had to struggle against de facto segregation. So they think that this segregation was imposed by law. Well, these decisions were by and large not imposed by law. And in fact, at the time that the sit-ins began, uh, in 1960, most of the southern municipalities had abolished their uh, segregation ordinances if they had them. And the reason they did that was that since Brown versus Board of Education, the principle was very clear uh, that state authorized or state sponsored or state implemented segregation was going to be illegal. And their strongest defense was the right of a private business person to decide on their own clientele. Uh, and the Supreme Court was not willing, and they never were willing, prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to rule that such exclusion that was unconstitutional. So they're making what they thought was a profit-maximizing business decision, and in every case that I'm aware of, and this picture, uh, the so-called first sit-in of uh, the Greensboro Four wasn't really the first. Uh, there have been other successful sit-ins, some with some success uh, in Oklahoma, and you can find roots of the tactic much earlier than that. Indeed, in Nashville, Tennessee, even in late 1959, they were planning sit-ins and had approached a couple of the leading businessmen, urging them to voluntarily desegregate. They got the response, no, that would be bad for business. So Nashville might have been first, and in a way it was the first major breakthrough, but Greensboro was the one that really got things rolling. The one that caught on, uh, the sit-in movement uh, began to spread as a result of this. In every case that I am aware of, the first reaction of the business people involved was to say no, to not go along, to think that they could wait them out, to have them arrested Closed the counter, fountain closed in interest of public safety. So now we can't risk violence, so we can't serve you a cup of coffee. Or put them in jail. Uh, not for violating segregation laws, but for trespassing. Here are people in a place where they're not welcome, they're asked to leave by the proprietor, they don't leave, that's trespassing. And so you have these cases. And many of them made it up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sometimes ruled in favor of the sit-inners on narrow grounds, but they never ruled uh, that the uh, they never ruled that the practice itself was unconstitutional, and they were not going to reach that. In other words, this was going to be the limit of kind of judge-made law uh, when it came to desegregation of privately provided public accommodation. So, uh, to make a long story short, in city after city, it was a matter of exerting economic pressure. The sit-ins were the most famous form, and, and they were costly. No question, in Greensboro itself, it was costly, and the costs were of two kinds. One, the black customers uh, weren't showing up, and secondly, the tumult uh, was discouraging white customers as well. Uh, and it was widely thought, well, this is the latest student fad, you know, uh, the governor of North Carolina, who himself had a whole chain of uh, uh, public accommodations, uh, said, yeah, last year it was hula hoops, you know, next year it'll be something else. He thought, yeah, we'll wait it out, they'll get tired of it. Well, it proved to be wrong. They were persistent. This was a serious group. Uh, it wasn't the same group coming back, it was a new group coming back. So late in 1960, 61, I've got a string of headlines from trade magazines like Women's Wear, The Daily, and Chain Store Age. They were inflicting heavy costs. I wish I had the precise magnitudes, but the point is, uh, it, it was a real economic burden, and they came to the conclusion. Uh, different times, different mechanisms, but the Southern business, not, not Southern, the 
Uh, coalitions of merchants and businessmen in particular metropolitan areas came to the conclusion they were reluctantly going to have to go along with what they thought was a very risky proposition. Uh, and it's risky both to the individual operator, the micro level, but also at the level of the downtown area where it was thought that if you have black people in here in a position of equality, they thought it would be equality to have people being served at the table or at the counter, uh, this whole area of town is going to become a ghetto, uh, which is a quote from one of the business people in the Greensboro case. So uh, it was really an exercise of economic leverage. They went along very reluctantly. What were the economic results? Well, that's the question I've tried to answer by digging out some quantitative data from the Federal Reserve's uh, monthly tracking uh, of uh, department store sales, uh, city by city. And these, this kind of data was widely discussed in the midst of the civil rights uh, uh, actions, but I'm not aware of any subsequent scholarship that has tried to track it uh, systematically. I've not tried to make use of any of the monthly data, I've just used the aggregate data, but uh, let me summarize what I find and show you graphs for two cities, and then I can tell you that there are similar graphs uh, for many others. First one is Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Uh, it was, in fact, part of the an authentic part of the South, part of the Cotton South, definitely practiced segregation, but it was one of the earliest ones uh, to change where the business community changed its ways. Uh, and here's Dallas Park store sales, starts in 1954. You see, growth was underway, but after they desegregated in 1962, there was a real takeoff to park store sales. In other words, contrary to their worst fears, it was actually a good business move. Uh, the black customers came back, and the white customers, to everyone's surprise, were not nearly as disturbed by the presence of blacks in the same department store or lunch counter as they had feared. Uh, so at least in the case of Dallas, uh, it seems to have been inadvertently a winning proposition from a business point of view, even though resisted. From an economic history standpoint, this is really remarkable. Usually we tell the history in terms of interest groups, like business groups, uh, contesting for their own interests one way or another. Here's a case where the business groups were, did not see their own well-being very clearly until after it was forced upon them. Well, that's Dallas. You might think Dallas not really part of the mainstream of the South. I don't have figures for Nashville, which is the first major triumph of a southern city outside uh, of Texas. But how about Little Rock? You've heard of Little Rock. That was the scene of one of the big blow-ups uh, in the school desegregation issue, and the one that everybody points to and got the headlines about it had that disruption of the public schools had a devastating effect on the recruitment of industrial investment into uh, the Little Rock area. It had come in large numbers until uh, the public schools were shut down in 1958, and then nobody came. Uh, a lot of businesses wanted to move south at the time, but they had their choice of places. They didn't have to go to a place that was going to be threatened with racial violence and where the public school system wasn't even operating. Uh, you might have thought that Little Rock would have learned its lesson, a kind of a moderate business group took over the school board and seemed to be back in power, but they too resisted the first sit-ins. They had them arrested. Uh, really, they had waited them out for up to a couple of years, thinking that they could do it. Finally, they came in. A secret meeting, uh, part of the bargaining was no publicity about this. They didn't want it. They weren't proud of what they were doing. Uh, and at one point, one of the negotiators said, well, okay, we're going to let, let's think of it, we're going to let the Negroes come in. Uh, but could you agree not to come in and patronize the downtown stores during the uni uh, University of Arkansas's football weekend uh, at homecoming? Because, oh, you could bargain with them. That's the way they thought, that this is going to be a sort of collectively negotiated presence that you could turn on or turn off. Finally, they went along very reluctantly in January 1st, 1963, only on some small part uh, of the business, which was restaurants and lunch counters. How successful it was. It was so successful that by June, they were had moved right on to uh, the theaters. And by the end of the year, it was a hotel. And Jet Magazine ran a feature later in 1963 saying this is about the most integrated city in the South. 
They resisted, but it turned out well for Southern business. People often ask, especially if I show a longer string of pictures here, how can we be sure that you're not just picking up the business cycle effect? Well, there is a business cycle effect, and I, I'm not sure it really matters from the viewpoint of the businessmen. What mattered to them was that they could join in the prosperity of the business cycle at the time. But just to respond to the question, uh, here's another picture, uh, which is retail sales, general merchandise, uh, as a share of the U.S. total. And it's quite a striking graph. Uh, because what it shows is that the South was growing relative to the nation until approximately 1960, 1960 and 1965, which was the five years of turbulence, both before the, uh, before the Civil Rights Act and during the first couple of years of implementation. Uh, and here's the bottom, 1965, and after that it turns around. So this is Southern Regional growth in this one category relative to the nation, and it's pretty clear uh, that caving in on civil rights, however reluctantly, was good for Southern business. Uh, in fact, uh, the national politics are quite interesting here because the Kennedy administration and then the Johnson administration after Kennedy's assassination thought, because they kept hearing from Southern businessmen, moderate Southern businessmen, the one thing we really don't want is heavy-handed, coercive federal legislation. Let us work this out on our own. We can do it. You know, eventually we're going to get there. They kept saying that. Uh, and they heard enough uh, that the administration actually began tracking the course of desegregation uh, in 566, they're monitoring 566 southern cities, which means you're talking about cities that are actually reasonably small towns. Uh, and they were tracking the segregation of theaters, restaurants, hotels, and lunch counters. They're not all the same. Some cities were desegregated for some, uh, and not for others. Uh, but it's perfectly true there was progress being made, but you could also see that what was happening was this voluntary or quasi-voluntary progress was coming to a point of diminishing returns. And uh, it began to dawn on them two things. Uh, one is they're never going to get complete desegregation through this voluntary route. Secondly, that kind of halfway desegregation is almost worse than none because this way, if you imagine yourself as a customer going out, you never know whether you can go to a place or not. Uh, you might put up signs, you, know, you might not, but the point is this was a real sore point for Southern black civil rights protesters and all this progress going on was not reducing the level of protest uh, at all. Uh, so this helps to explain something that uh, really did puzzle me greatly, which was why it was that this proposal for a national civil rights public accommodations measure, which basically declared most of the states outside the South had such legislation already, but for the South, uh, the states, and even in these supposedly enlightened business community towns like Atlanta, they were not going to do this on their own. Uh, so, uh, it helps to explain why that proposal went from being almost unthinkable. Uh, as early as early 1963, the Kennedy administration was proposing a very limited form of liberalization. It would apply only to public accommodations in close proximity to a direct involvement with interstate commerce, because they were going to use the commerce clause. Uh, and then uh, by June, they said, no, okay, we're, we had a more radical proposal, but uh, a more complete proposal, but uh, it was given very little chance of passage. Uh, even though, in retrospect, this seems like the smallest, the most minor issue, the one that was easiest to solve at the time, it was the hang-up. It was the one that was going to be most difficult to pass. Well, here, I discovered a turning point in this discussion. Uh, and this was an editorial in a magazine called Chain Store Age. You know, interesting reading when you get this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chain Store Age. July 1963, uh, they come in an editorial that a federal law prohibiting racial discrimination of retail outlets would be helpful to retailers would seem to be rather obvious. This in a journal that had never said a single word on this entire subject. Now they say it's obvious. And then they say, one possible problem, though, is uh, that chains will have to propose, oppose 
segregated and had to compete with a still segregated competition. And indeed, uh, the court, in upholding the law, used this exact same logic. Uh, they said, yeah, uh, we're basing this on interstate commerce. Segregation discourages interstate commerce, but we can't limit it to only those establishments directly engaged uh, in interstate commerce because uh, they will be competing with other local uh, areas, and if they don't have to desegregate, that's going to discourage, they'll have a competitive advantage, and that will discourage interstate commerce. I actually think it's true. The whole reason they were in that was they didn't want to make it a human rights uh, 14th Amendment case, but even so, uh, I think their logic was correct. Now, here's another document that will make interesting reading. Uh, one of the leaders of the President's Committee uh, in 1964 formed to promote desegregation among the business community. One businessman talk, uh, talking to another, and this was Julius Manger, uh, a real civil rights hero in my book, but I can't find his name in any of the standard civil rights histories. Uh, he uh, after the success of the law, so this is uh, September 25th, 1964, a celebratory occasion, he wrote up a memoir saying, here's, here's basically the way I persuaded them to go along. He said, first of all, he would acknowledge, I understand what you're saying, unilateral desegregation would be economic suicide. And this all supports my view that this was a business decision. He said, I understand, we wouldn't ask you to do this on your own, we're asking you to do it as part of a group. And secondly, he was able to say, uh, down here, that he had his own investments in Charlotte and Savannah, and they had desegregated, and it seemed to have turned out all right. So here's a guy saying, okay, look, I'm one of you. You can do it too. And then he pointed out, and this must have been a powerful point, Negroes did not cry in public accommodations once they were given the right to use them, but quite the contrary, they used public accommodations much less than would be expected. Uh, now, James Farmer was actually at the event where he made this statement, and he found this a rather offensive thing to say. There was another line in there about, well, you don't have to accept the Negroes unless they're well-dressed and well-behaved. Uh, and the report of the event said, well, they talked it over and came to a mutual understanding. But you can see the difference between the perspective of a civil rights activist and how they would put it, and how a moderate businessman would put it, trying to explain other moderate businessmen, but that uh, ultimately, by the time they got to this point, uh, that was a powerful, persuasive uh, measure. So sometimes economists are inclined to say, oh, well, what, it really was a coordination problem. Yes, it was a coordination problem. Uh, that is to say, it became a coordination problem, but only after uh, many of these desegregation settlements had been arrived at under pressure in one metropolitan area after another. Once they had made their own peace with the desegregation issue, uh, I don't want to say that these businessmen were actively pushing the legislation to Congress, but they were passively allowing it to happen, uh, much to the surprise uh, of some of the stout resistors. Uh, and then, of course, having done that, there was one more piece. Uh, uh, what's the last step in the agenda? The last step in the business eye view agenda on public accommodations is uh, to rewrite the history. Uh, to set out what? Wipe the American claim, the claim that you were uh, a risk taking, innovative uh, leader. Carl Abbott uh, has some wonderful, juicy quotes on this that I love to quote, but uh, I'm only going to give you one quote, and this comes from Bill Chase's book about the Greensboro case. Uh, there was a new uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce who came to town shortly after the crisis had been settled. Said, when I first got to Greensboro, I had the white, white power structure condemning the city administrations as if they were subversives. This was a hot issue. It split the town. People said you can't give in to these protesters and so on. Five years later, I heard the mayor of the city brag about the fact that we were the home of the nation's first city. And we had invented the electric light bulb. <laughs> I have trouble working up indignation over this. Yes, it's full of hypocrisy and it's bad history. But maybe this is the American way. Kind of feel good, business, paper over, let's forget the hard times. Uh, I don't recommend it to students of history or economics, but. Still, I can understand uh, what they were trying to do. Let's make it a tourist direction, uh, attraction uh, and let's celebrate what, it, what has happened here. And now civil rights tourism is big business all over the South. Uh, well, that is a very quick...
quick synopsis about public accommodations, and what I want to do is move on and give an even quicker synopsis of a few of the other areas that I'm uh, trying to cover, uh, and then there'll be time for uh, questions. Uh, I have a section, and this will be the main topic tomorrow, desegregating labor markets. There were cases where you had almost an overnight um, effect of the labor section of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and one case in point is uh, the textiles industry. By menial jobs. Uh, well, for as far back as the industry went, uh, at least uh, to the Civil War, uh, you have 5% males, black males, virtually zero females in an industry that was historically uh, a very important employment opportunity for women, but not for black women. Uh, and these 5% males were like night watchmen or, uh, or the package box crate opening kinds of jobs. They were not the machine tending jobs that were the main, uh, the main job ladder in this industry. It changed almost overnight in 1964. Why, why, why would a profit seeking industry uh, not want to hire qualified employers and why would they change so rapidly? Uh, one line of argument is they were using the Civil Rights Act as an excuse to do uh, what they really wanted to do all along. There may be some truth in that. I devote quite a bit of space, though, to refuting, refuting the idea that this was all just a consequence of tight labor markets. Uh, you did not find any textile manufacturer going up to Washington and testifying in favor uh, of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, in 1963 and 1964. In fact, when the Equal Employment uh, Commission came to North Carolina to hold hearings, they snubbed them. They bitterly complained about these unfair criticisms. Uh, but then when the law passed, uh, they changed. Uh, and they changed because maybe there was some that could see that this would benefit them. But they changed because you had a large turnout of black applicants for jobs that they now felt they had a right to. Uh, and I have a brochure, although it's not in the slides uh, today. Uh, it was put out uh, by the Equal Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, and it was to know your rights. Uh, the industry has changed. You think you're going to get turned down? Give it a try. And if they give you any trouble, here's the number to call to get in touch with the legal office. In other words, they really were uh, responding to pressure. And when they responded to pressure, they learned, not necessarily immediately, but over time, that you know these black workers were not bad workers. Uh, they had bought into uh, the idea that the segregation reflected in job patterns was a sort of a natural segregation representing the capabilities and abilities of the, uh, of the two races. Uh, under pressure, they had to change. And here's a story that I like. This is a manager, Vander Mills. Uh, he was working at, uh, they were employing black workers. Uh, and he read a news story or heard a news account on the radio saying uh, that blacks were good workers. And he said he was very curious because that was not what he was hearing from his foreman and supervisors who were telling him that the Negroes were employed or shift this lazy, don't want to work and leave as soon as they're hired. There's a phenomenon in psychology here. Maybe it's in behavioral economics now called confirmation bias. That if you're looking at noisy signals, and these kind of signals are always noisy, uh, most people will extract the conclusion that confirms what, what they already thought. So they're getting these reports on the job saying, yeah, these Negroes are really uh, uh, not worth much. But uh, being a good manager, he did what, of course, he should have done years before, commissioned a systematic study, and the upshot of that study was no significant difference in productivity, no discernible difference in productivity, except for a couple of departments where the black workers were actually uh, slightly better. Uh, so that, according to the New York Times, by 1969, virtually all the large companies here have begun to preach the doctrine of equal colorblind employment. Once they changed, they too, they couldn't very well rewrite their history, but they could say, look, this is better for everybody. They're starting to preach and encourage racial understanding because once they knew they had to hire black workers, uh, they had a, internalized the self-interest in at least having the races get along with each other. So I really think there was positive progress both in the assessment 
of black workers, capability, uh, and also in race relations uh, on the job. So then I have a chapter on voting rights. That's a different piece of legislation. Uh, you wouldn't have had a dramatic change in black voter registration rates such as this. You had gradual progress. This is kind of where we thought we were in 1963. Uh, you can project those lines, and, and you might find that the black registration rate would catch up to the white registration rate, oh, you know, around 1990 or 2000. This is going to be a very, very long-term gradual matter of individual black applicants working up their nerve and going in and maybe practicing reading some passage from the state constitution or something like that. And of course, it wasn't like that at all. You got this heavy-handed federal legislation in the Voting Rights Act. You still had to have, just because there were going to be registrars, federal registrars or observers, uh, the threat of prosecution, you still had to have the active participation of the grassroots people going in there. And they did have to work up their nerve, but they did it in large numbers. So that almost overnight, you got a big jump in registration rates. It took a much, much longer time for that jump in registration to be translated into uh, actual uh, representation, except in a few places where you had black majority counties, Warren County being one, uh, you got a black sheriff uh, or black uh, county commissioners very quickly. Most places it took a lot of time and effort and litigation because uh, Southerners, uh, having caved in on public accommodations and to some degree uh, on labor desegregation, they were not caving in on politics. Uh, so there too, it's a much longer story. I don't want to tell you that the civil rights legislation of 64 and 65 was an overnight success. Uh, and within a few years after that, you can look at the various assessments and find a lot of people very skeptical. How much really has changed? But, let me move on to my point about the distinctiveness of the South. In time, this is black elected officials, starting in 1969, very, very rare uh, in the South. A little less rare in the North. Both of them were gaining over time, but as of about the early 1980s, the South has moved far ahead of the North in black <coughs> officials. Of course, this is mainly a demographic thing. Of course, they have more black elected officials because there are more black people in the South. But here's another table. This may be about the only table I'm going to click on you today, but I've never seen this fact, this statistical fact, anywhere else. Percentage of black elected officials divided by percentage of the population, and you can see that county commissioners in Alabama are almost in proportion to the black size of the population. Uh, and all elected officials, it is 70%. That may not be high enough, but it's a lot higher than anywhere in the non south, where the overall rate is 10%, state like Michigan, uh, only 15%. The point is, blacks are not only uh, more represented in the South, they are more represented relative to their share of the population than anywhere else. Uh, one thing I often hear is, well, civil rights uh, did a lot, but it did a lot of damage too. Uh, it destroyed black businesses, for example, and it's perfectly true that segregation created a kind of a captive market for a lot of black businesses, such as the brown cigarette that we lived in, uh, in Warrington. But uh, my main point is that the rise of uh, relative economic status within the South has recreated a relatively large numbers of black-owned businesses. So here's a map of black-owned firms as a percent of all firms in the state in 1997. Uh, and you can see the South leads the nation. I'm not trying to say it's a large share overall. These are still relatively small numbers. But it's a lot larger in the South. Similar map for 2007, uh, black owned firms as a percentage of all firms in the state. Yeah, New York and Illinois are on the map too, but it's mostly in the south. Uh, another thing you often hear is, yeah, well, it was good for the middle class, uh, but it didn't do much for ordinary people. Of course, there's an element of tautology in that statement. If you define being middle class as somebody who goes to school uh, and gets a decent job, well, of course, then yes, anyone where there's some success, you could say that's middle class, but didn't they start out middle class? Uh, recent scholarship about basic uh, 
matter such as access to high quality health care, show that the civil rights revolution, desegregation had dramatic effects on relative health and disease incidents among the black population. So here's one graph to show that. It's for the state of Mississippi. Most of the unable infant death rates from diarrhea and pneumonia. Uh, here's the white rate. First year here is 1955. Black rate much higher. It came down dramatically in the 1960s, and that was for one reason. Uh, the reason is the desegregation of federally financed hospitals. That's one of the dark secrets. It wasn't just the South uh, that went along with this. The Hill Burton Act supplied, it, it supplied federal support for hospitals, uh, and it did so. Uh, it, um, and it, and it, it acquiesced in segregation in the southern states. So you had the most dramatic reduction in the size of the poverty population between 1959 and 1978, and I argue that the great bulk of the effect there was not the war on poverty, it was the Civil Rights Act opening up job opportunities and improving basic uh, well-being uh, at the low end of the population. Let me uh, try to move towards a conclusion with a couple of summary graphs. Uh, one of them is this, emphasizing the regional effect here. This is the usual black male income comparing the South, Midwest, and Northeast. In the 1950s, black, Southern blacks were basically the poorest people in the nation, way, way below the rest of the uh, country, even below blacks in the rest of the country. There has been dramatic gains in the South, which I argue are a consequence of the Civil Rights Revolution, so that by the end of the century, the South is no longer the low income area of the black population. Uh, it has matched uh, the Midwest and the Northeast. If you compare Southern whites and Southern blacks, you find the same information here, namely that before the civil rights breakthroughs, blacks were not sharing in the growth of the Southern regional economy. Uh, this line's going down, while well, this line's going up. But then the civil rights breakthroughs of the 60s, blacks began to gain. And as I'll show you in a minute, because of those gains, they began to move back in the South in large numbers. Uh, catching up between blacks and whites, no. Uh, but the relative change is pretty dramatic. It goes from 40% here, 60% here, to 75% by the end of the boom of the 1990s. Uh, this is what I mean when I say there's a whole regional dimension uh, to the race issue, which is usually missed. Uh, and uh, the other key point about it, this is not as good a graph as these others, is the turnaround of black migration. We had massive black out migration from the South by the millions until when? I dated, really, from 1964 and 1965. Those job opportunities in the textiles industries were enough to bring blacks into it. Uh, and we've had, this is the zero line here, positive black in migration into the South ever since. And that has continued even during the hard times uh, of Decade. Uh, and some evil, some economists, again, there's some impulse somewhere to say, no, you know, we can explain these things in very simple terms. It's just a matter of convergence. The South was isolated from the rest of the nation, and yeah, that's what I argue with the South New South. And now they've converged. Well, it's a strange kind of economic convergence, though. We usually you have convergence happening because people move from the low income area to the high income area. Here you have people moving from the high income area to the low income area and convergence coming about through that channel. So yes, it's a kind of a convergence, but as I'll show you tomorrow, it is much more than convergence. Uh, I put it down to, and we can have a discussion, exactly why is it uh, that the South has done better than the North? Uh, and there's a good a list of reasons I won't try to uh, cover it now. Uh, when I mention it to white Southerners, they say something along the lines of, well, yes, you know, we've known each other on such intimate terms for so long a time that it's a kind of a racial uh, understanding that was latent to there. It just had to be brought out by... Black Southerners usually don't buy into that uh, idea at all. Uh, but what they do uh, think, and what I think is probably more prominent, is you have viable middle-class black communities primarily in these uh, metropolitan areas, and that what really has happened over time is uh, civil rights was not a redistributionary measure, it was a reintegration of the black population uh, into the mainstream of the southern economy. Uh, some of it operating through political channels uh, and some of it operating uh, through economic channels. Yes, economic forces and economic incentives have played a strong uh, role here, but 
things had to be shaped and directed politically uh, in order for that to happen. So that, in a nutshell, is my story about who won, who lost. Uh, this was not a case where one group won at the expense of another. You never find, uh, in this graph or any other, a case where black progress was gaining uh, and whites were losing uh, as a result. And I try to make that case systematically uh, throughout the book. So I think it was a win-win revolution. Uh, that's undoubtedly a simplification, but uh, that is the theme that I try to carry through the book. And I think I've probably talked enough, and I should stop and take some questions. Uh, so that's one of the ways uh, 
uh, in which being more inclusive most certainly contributed to a progress that they all shared in. Then you have Black Mayor uh, Arrington in there, and he worked closely with the white business community. And of course, black mayors who do that and commit for having criticism, some of it might be justified in the sense that, well, he doesn't have to do much for poverty. Uh, he's just like the old uh, mayors. They, they, all they want to, uh, is business. Uh, but the joint of that is, look, a mayor can't do too much about poverty. And anyway, business is going to be uh, good for all of us. Plus, a black mayor has a powerful effect on the allocation of contracts and on the allocation of both municipal jobs and private sector jobs that are sponsored by federal money. So, yeah, the criticism is true that this is not a, a whole new world. Uh, it's kind of the old capitalist world, but in a much more uh, inclusive way. Thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. I was uh, stimulated by it to uh, recall my own experience leaving Oregon to go to graduate school, very much like yours in the United States. And our first major teaching assignment was in the Atlantic Coast Conference uh, University System. Uh, and what I noticed is, first of all, there were parallel schools, University of, which was white, and then the name, as in Maryland State, Virginia State, yes. South Carolina State, Delaware State, which were blacks only. And the transformation occurred when the athletes that used to make it straight into the National Football League, the uh, National Basketball Association, were going to the large state university, and that seemed to be a success story very similar to the business model. Uh, and I think it could also be qualified in a similar way. Uh, you know, Clemson, which was a sort of an outrageous case, is now gone exactly in the opposite direction, yes. where the entire football team is African American, which is, you know, uh, more important in South Carolina than maybe anything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 the second thought that occurred to me is um, uh, the prevalence of military bases in the South, which is much larger than in other parts of the here in Oregon. And uh, the, the, the bases were integrated and they also provided opportunities for employment, for making uh, all sorts of services. And uh, that this model uh, might further support your argument. I think those are, those are very good connections. I, I really wish I could do more with the second one. One of the referees, my management, said that. Yeah, surely this must have been a big thing because the South had more bases than uh, anywhere else, and uh, uh, I don't know who's written about this. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm still looking, maybe there's something. Uh, I do know when we, Kate and I spent a lot of time reading in the case files on public accommodations complaints that are now in the National Archives, Justice Department, you find a lot of representation uh, for, for uh, armed service people. Black and white, coming from the, they go out for uh, a drink or something like that, and one of them is mistreated, and you know, what's this, you know, I'm, I'm representing our country. Uh, that was a powerful uh, tool, but, but that, that can't be the main thing. Uh, the, the kind of, uh, at least, well, it's one main thing, but that's, but that's kind of comes after the legislation. Certainly the South became very attached to the money coming in, uh, in connection with uh, those bases, so the, the broader effect would be the leverage that the federal government had for the fact that it was spending a lot of money and a lot of it in the South. Yeah, I, uh, the sports connection is, a, is another very good one. The, the best I have is a story about, well, it seems pretty clear. When did the Atlanta Braves, that is, when did the Milwaukee Braves move to Atlanta? 1965. It was a direct consequence. Their star player was Henry Aaron. I may have the only chapter that actually mentions both Aaron Henry and Henry Aaron in the same chapter. <laughs> he came from Mobile, Alabama. He initially was very reluctant to go back to Atlanta. But some of the local businessmen showed him around time. He realized he was going to be uh, well treated and came to think things are changing here. Uh, so uh, he came and, uh, and that was the first breakthrough in terms of a major league uh, franchise in the South, and now there are quite a few of them, and it's hard to picture how that ever could have happened uh, in the absence of
And I have a couple of questions. One is, do you also look at measures of wealth, in terms of wealth inequality? Uh, and then the second one is, uh, is, it, is there an implication here that, that blacks are doing better relative compared to whites in this region compared to other regions? The second one is easier because I, I think it's true. Uh, relative gains uh, are higher. Yeah, I mean, some of it, I thought you were going to say, well, part of the reason the growth rate has been higher is they started out so far behind. There's some truth in that. There wasn't. There's a catch-up effect. Now, uh, it's not just that blacks in the South have somewhat higher, to me, to really do it right, you need to control for uh, other variables. But uh, you do that, you still get a, a slight advantage of the South, and you still get uh, migration. But their incomes relative to whites uh, are higher in the South, I think, than uh, anywhere else. No, I don't do much with wealth, and of course I should. Uh, and there's a recent literature, but as best I can tell, I, I couldn't find, you know, I'm kind of limited. I want to do before and after, uh, and I, I couldn't do that for wealth. But the point is, that people make is a very valid one, which is just looking at current income uh, is misleading. Uh, because it makes it look like, well, blacks, at least in some areas, are uh, coming close to catching up. But they're not catching up. You know, wealth is something that accumulates over a much longer time, and it serves as a backstop uh, when things, when your income fluctuates. And by that measure, uh, no, black, blacks are much farther behind, and that's true in the South and, and everywhere else. So uh, I don't claim that I'm really trying to do a comprehensive. Uh, it's partly why I choose the civil rights label because I can define a few issues that I think I can get at, but I don't kid myself. That Thank you. 
this I'm interested. The World Congress of Economic History between Hell and Stellenbosch this summer. I want to come to that. Uh, uh, to post a talk, uh, basically present this stuff, but then ask that question, how does it compare? You know, the two cases are not independent. They borrow from each other. Uh, and uh, this idea of uh, John W. Sells, where I first encountered it, the idea, don't think of segregation Urban segregation, the demand for physical separation uh, in the lunch counters and the theaters and things like that. Don't think of that as a kind of backwards measure that is going to go away and become more and more incompatible with profits. No, those were the progressives. Uh, they were trying to figure out uh, how to make uh, modern urban areas compatible with. Uh, Separated society. And they thought this was a way to keep the peace. At least somehow they fooled themselves uh, that this, maybe they were fooling, maybe there was even a, a point to it, but that was common. Uh, that was uh, roughly, uh, well, the U.S. You know, came in between 1900, the, the kind of codified version of Jim Crow came in between 1900, and it was on the rise in the 20s and on the rise in the 30s. And uh, really think there was nothing. gradually chipping away uh, at this, uh, at, well, that's a point of similarity. There are huge differences between the two cases uh, in the end. I uh, sometimes wonder if it's even worth comparing them. Uh, but on some of these points, there, there's, a, there's a kind of eerie uh, similarity. The big difference was, was, was the model. Uh, in the South, blacks were a minority, and they are still a minority. Uh, what that do with my clicker? Uh, a couple of slides I didn't show. Graphs like this for four southern states that at one point in history were black majority states. Well, imagine how the civil rights revolution would be different if they were still black majority states. This is South Carolina with the black majority as late as 1920. And now blacks have been returning, yes, even to South Carolina. But of course, the black so called return migration is not nearly as big as the inflow of white people from all over, really, so that we're looking at a minority situation, and that's true in every southern state, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Georgia, they come in and it's somewhere in the 30%. And this is the problem for trying to have a viable two-party competitive system in the South. The Democratic Party is a black majority party. Uh, and so you have to persuade whites to join or ally with and work with black majority party, and I'm not saying it can't be done. In fact, it has been done successfully at different times, but it's an uphill struggle. Uh, so uh, this is the, the frustration, <laughs> is that what you, you might have hoped and thought that this would kind of lead to a kind of unfolding of progressive trend that would just be unstoppable, and it kind of has been uh, stopped now. Not, not reversing the civil rights breakthroughs, but, uh, but some, of the, uh, some of the other forms of progress. So, I don't know, I, I, I still have a lot to learn about uh, South Africa. Uh, they were both two countries that, uh, well, two region and a country that felt so strongly, the White South uh, and the party in South Africa, about their system that they were willing to turn their back on public opinion changing everywhere else, and they really thought it was good for them economically. And in both cases, they entertained a kind of a nightmare scenario of what would happen if they ever did. Yes, not entirely economic. Saying everybody was motivated primarily by uh, economics. Uh, but uh, I do think their, their fears were augmented by economic fears in both cases. It's a question of the party. Yes? How do you explain the majority of uh, prison population today is of blacks? And that's not like 50, 60%. It's like 8 out of 10. We don't know what that is. Exactly. So, no. 
to say we moved into a post-racial society. I don't say that. Uh, and uh, the prison populations, north and south, make the best evidence of how far away from that. Uh, in fact, in my concluding chapter, I try to say, look, there's a, there's a kind of mismatch here. Uh, the, the highest rhetoric and the rhetoric lots of people identify with the civil rights movement is a colorblind rhetoric. rhetoric. Race doesn't matter anymore. So, yes, uh, part of my lifetime agenda is to try to, 
you know, what we say at Stanford is we're not anti-economics in economic history. We accept economics as the parent discipline, uh, but we want it to be historical economics, and that often means getting into institutions, getting into culture, getting into attitudes and psychology. Uh, it's not that we're the only ones doing it, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it, it often seems to be an, an uphill struggle. Because see, everything I present today and everything in the whole book, it is not a technical book. But the issues I'm wrestling with are the issues as defined by economics. Which I'm trying to say, why do these business people not want to hire black workers? Well, economics has an easy answer to that, which is, well, prejudiced by the white workers. They don't want to insult their white workers. I think that is too easy. Uh, because you do not find that Southern employers were chomping at the bit to try to make this change. They didn't like this legislation. They didn't want to, and most of them, not textiles, but the others, they dragged their feet. They had to go to court. So I'm saying, no, we need a better answer to that. I think the better answer is that they bought into the prejudicial attitudes uh, of the times. There's nothing impossible about that. Uh, it's not incompatible with economics, but most economists are inclined to think that no rational businessmen are not going to make mistakes like that. You know, they're going to find the truth. I say, well, you have a lot of periods of history where businessmen are no more likely to find the truth uh, than others. They're members of society, and especially with segregation, kind of blocks the degree of experimentation that might lead you to uh, lead you to discover uh, the errors of your ways. Yeah. It, it, Look about the, the athletic uh, case. You know, we now see uh, that if you want to be competitive, you have to have black uh, players. They went for all those years. Uh, I think not just, I mean, I, there are competing theories here, I'll admit. One theory is they knew the blacks were better players all along and they didn't want that competition. But, you know, I played basketball, true, not in the South, uh, before this big switch. We didn't, we didn't know. We, we didn't think. We, we had no reason to think uh, that basketball was going to, so, uh, what I'm saying is we, we were making the same kind of erroneous uh, assumptions. So uh, that's just an illustration rather than a direct answer. Yes, both sides uh, can contribute. Uh, and I just, the, the challenge I often have is historians think, uh, not, not being hung up, <laughs> uh, somehow having to restate or characterize their interpretations in terms of economic uh, analysis, uh, they often think, well, we're, why are you struggling with this? It just uh, isn't significant. Well, for me, it's, it's significant. And I also think it's significant if we want to come up with an economic history that will, that, that will speak to the economics uh, profession. So I think that here's a powerful example where heavy-handed, centralized federal legislation led to not just a positive outcome for racial justice, but an actual benefit for the whole region. You know, you think, people often think, well, the federal government can't do anything right. Uh, and uh, especially heavy-handed, coercive type legislation. No nonsense. They were moving into these little towns and prosecuting Dairy Queen operators. It seems absurd when you read those files. Uh, but the point is, they had to show they were serious about that measure. And within a few years, they worked and they changed society. So uh, that's... Just having one good example of that, I think, uh, counts for a lot uh, if, uh, if you're trying to uh, talk about the possibilities for it. So, in other words, I'll endorse Mary State. There's a policy. You can't go back to those times and say, let's do the same policy. No, times always change. Uh, but sometimes, you know, a powerful, simple rule that says we're going to change a uh, coordinating mechanism like this uh, can really work wonders. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I don't know how, it would be nice if your thesis could be accepted because when I lived in, because politicians are still using race to divide groups, right? I lived in California all my life and moved to North Carolina and was shocked when I saw a television advertisement with your, uh, who's that uh, guy, Gantz? Harvey Gantz. Harvey Gantz was running. Uh, and who was that senator that died? Senator Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms. So one of the commercials was uh, a black hand shaking an employer's white hand. So the black worker shaking an employer's white hand. So it was a message to the whites. You vote for Gantz, 
you're losing your jobs, right? You're going to get more job competition. I'm shocked. This is in the mid '90s. This, These uh, television commercials. Jason and I went to a conference uh, on civil rights history of South Carolina, held at the Citadel of all places. <laughs> speaker after speaker stood up and I never dreamed I'd be uh, talking at the Citadel. <laughs> Citadel. Uh, so, uh, yes, if you think uh, nothing's changed, there were women cadets and there were black cadets, uh, even at the Citadel. But Harvey Gantt was one of the keynote speakers. He ran twice against Jesse Helms. He was leading in the polls until those brochures arrived. Harvey Gantt amazes me how he has maintained his equanimity. There was no bitterness. He talked about, well, okay, here's one of the icons of the South. He had to resort to tactics like this. So he was able to find hope uh, <laughs> in, uh, out of that situation. And so I uh, think we should all, uh, yeah, well, you know, maybe there's some hope in the fact that they aren't do quite doing that anymore. But maybe you're right that it hasn't changed. You know, you heard Newt Gingrich talk in South Carolina about Obama being the food stamp president and everybody knew oh, yeah. what he meant by that. So, uh, yeah, the coded language uh, is, uh, is definitely there. And it, it's part of what I mean when I say it. Really, to tell the story about the history, you can't just say racial barriers were knocked down. You have to acknowledge that there was a race-based mobilization uh, as, as an expression of the people. And uh, you have to acknowledge that. Uh, the, the question is, you know, how far can we go in the future with that kind of basis for mobilization? Because we're going to need multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalitions uh, to, to get uh, any further in the South and everywhere else. Can I ask you a question about yeah. the uh, women's rights
Stacy's working not so much on the blue collar area, but on college women. Uh, it was really only uh, in the late 60s that women began to be accepted into law schools, business schools, medical schools, and it's correlated with the fact that they began to change their choice of majors. Uh, I have a, a nice quote from uh, Alice Kessler uh, Harris, a historian, uh, probably, uh, in 1964. It's so frustrating that women come into college and they're so full of ambition and energy and they're so smart, but by their junior year, reality has set in and they've chosen to settle for one of the traditional women's majors like teaching or nursing or something like that. That all changed. Uh, and it changed almost historically overnight. They began a major in economics uh, and, uh, and free law and, and things like that. I don't think that was driven uh, by uh, demand pressure coming at the uh, end of that pipeline. Uh, certainly, the, the, I think the best case for your point would be the fact that women's labor force participation was rising throughout the post World War II period. And most of that was not very exciting professional jobs, and some of that was demand uh, pressure. That, that's true, and uh, a lot of it was a change in family structure and so on. But even so, uh, broadly speaking, I would classify that too as one of these unanticipated revolutions that. After the fact, it was inevitable, uh, and you know, when I speak to economists, they say, oh, there's no way the economy couldn't have continued uh, without having, making better use of its, uh, of its women labor. Well, but they continue, we continued for a, a century, somehow rationalizing. <laughs> you can go to college and uh, you'll come out and get married, and yeah, you'll be a better quality mother, and so on. Yeah, people believe these are flimsy rationalizations, but Somehow they accept, and even most women uh, who at least talked in the public sphere uh, bought into that uh, uh, male breadwinner model uh, until they stopped buying into it, uh, and that was a kind of a generational shift that happened very fast. So there's a lot more to be said there, and I should be uh, doing more in it, but it's just not something I've made much. Uh, of this sort of racial gap in, in income. Yeah. And how much do you think that's a factor of just it's, it's, it's where we came from and it's, you know, despite the large growth that happened uh, directly after the civil rights legislation, you know, how much of that is still the dragging feet on the racial issue and or, or how much have the issues changed that are causing this sort of racial disparity? Well, see, if you ask a, a 
labor historian, of course, you could ask more than one, and they have more than one opinion. But by and large, they, they tend to treat these as uh, very empirical matters. That is, you'll run uh, regressions and you'll assign a certain weight to discrimination and a certain weight to, uh, to educational uh, attainment and things like that. And they find uh, that the majority of the gap today can be uh, accounted for by uh, things like uh, education and family background. But uh, you have to believe, you don't, you're, not, you're not required to accept that methodology because when you say education and family background, the question, well, okay, but what are the aspects of it? Uh, and I, I don't, um, I don't want to, and, but, but the point they're making is, well, it's not outright uh, discrimination of the old uh, type. And there's a lot of truth in that, but see, I think one of the big reasons why progress has been better and more persistent in the South is black representation in things like the hiring process within corporations. The studies show it makes a huge difference. Uh, and it, it, may, it probably isn't conscious prejudice, but the race of the hiring officer has a big effect both on who gets hired and on how long they stay. So I think that racial representation, now that's still a legacy of the past. Uh, so it partly fits under the, the heading that you offered me. But uh, that's really uh, what I mean when I say, you know, the, the best fix now, or the best kind of avenue for progress is, is, not, is not primarily litigation, uh, but uh, representation. And it's, it's a kind of a justification for a kind of an affirmative action program, not, not so much in the, uh, in the specific jobs, but in the decision-making process. And, it's not that it's happening sufficiently anywhere, but it's happening more so uh, in the South. So I, I haven't given you a very precise answer to your question, but that's I don't really have one. Uh, it's definitely a different breed uh, of discrimination, but it, it is not. <laughs> well, I, I, I have one bit of analysis, I think, for tomorrow. It's interesting to compare the relative success of integration of the workplace compared to the schools. Because in schools, you have a lot of integration, a lot of this is, is not stuck in. Uh, that's a complex answer, but I, I think the big factor is that in the business world, you can at least get the leadership of the company to internalize some of these important social dimensions. That they've got an interest in having their white and black employees at least get along with each other and presumably cooperate and actually work together for the team. Uh, schools sometimes have that kind of thing, maybe on the sports team or the drama club, but by and large, Schools and school districts are not in a position to internalize because their population, uh, it's an open population. They can come and go, uh, and they do come and go, with relatively minor concerns or fears. Uh, so it's only in that relative term, relative employment relative to schools and the South relative to elsewhere, that, that I really want to.